Hey, what's up, y'all? My name is Wilbur Dell Cooper, and I'm super excited to be chopping it up with Charlie XCX. Yeah, let's play some noise, right? Yo, Charlie is a singer, a songwriter, an entrepreneur. She's a music video director, a record label executive, an advocate for women's rights, and an ally to the LGBTQ community. So tonight, we're gonna be talking about her journey through the music industry and how she uses her platform to not only create great art, but to also support other artists and creatives. Everybody, let's make some real noise for Charlie XCX. Turn up! What's up, girl? Thanks for coming. I didn't know if anyone would come, but <laughs> cool that you came, so thank you. <laughs> That's what's up. Well, I meant everything that I said. I think you are like the dopest in the game and you're dope at everything, whether it's making music, making music videos, you know, putting on other artists. And I think uh, I want to get into just how dope you are oh, in thanks. 2020. Cool. But I feel like to do it properly, we got to take it back. Yeah. You know, we might have to take it back to 1999, you know? <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so can you paint a picture for me of young Charlie and what, what, what she was like back in the day? Yeah, I mean, um, I was kind of just like, I was kind of a nerd, really, you know? Before music, um, I was, I was just somebody who kind of like, went to school and was like really afraid to kind of like step out of line or do anything but like I was a I was like a goody goody you know <laughs> my parents were really like you have to get good grades you have to like never bunk off like you know it was really about that for me um and I wasn't like popular I wasn't like really unpopular I just like had my friends and I like got good grades and that was it. It was, it was, it was nothing really interesting to say, you know, it was like, but I, I didn't really feel like I found my identity as a person really until I started exploring music and how music made me feel and, and creating music made me feel. And that was kind of when I was like 13, 14, that's I think when I started experimenting with music and really discovering that I had all of these interests outside of like going to school, which wasn't really like the interest that I chose. It was just kind of forced upon me, but music was a choice for me that um, really kind of helped me grow. And it kind of felt like my own secret world. Was there like a particular song or like a music video or something that, that you saw and it kind of opened up that world to you or made you see something different? I mean, I think when I was like young, younger, it was Britney Spears really like blew my mind. Um, especially the Hit Me Baby One More Time video that would, I remember being at home and watching that and just thinking like I'd never seen somebody so like glamorous and cool and fun. I was like, I like, I mean, it was real, but I like really like bought into the dream. I was like, wow, I want to be Britney, you know? Um, <laughs> but really, I think, the thing that kind of really inspired me to um, really like start making my own music was when I discovered um, Ed Banger Records, which is a French electro uh, record label. Um, and when I was listening to like Justice and Sebastian and Uffy, like Uffy was a really big kind of um, influence on me and um, listening to the music that those artists made, made me feel cool. Like I felt cool that I knew about these artists and I felt like whenever I would listen to their music, I felt like I was in a movie um, and it felt, made me feel alive and not 
that much music even still to this day, apart from like Sophie and AG, who I'm sure we'll get onto later, like not a lot of music makes me feel like truly alive, like um, that stuff, that French electro stuff did. And was there a group of, of people who you were kind of going on this journey with, like listening to music and exploring records and going to shows and stuff like um, that? Honestly, no. Uh, it was very much um, an isolated ex experience. And I think as I've gotten older and kind of like look back at my career, I've realized that actually when I was 14 and younger and kind of like pre, I suppose, um, the mixtapes, that I pre Vroom Vroom, let's say, all I really wanted actually in music was I wanted like a creative group of people who I could bounce ideas off and be inspired by. And I really wanted these like allies and friends and this crew, I really wanted it. And cause that's what like the Ed Banger crew had, you know, and I really wanted to feel that and like talk to, um, you know, my friends about music and um, go to shows with my friends and there was a little bit of that, but you know, we were in school and like I was going to raves at the weekends and their parents were like, you can't do that. That's crazy. <laughs> so, um, so I was, I was very much, I kind of was living this like double life for a while, but I think I always craved that sense of community. And I think that's why, um, collaboration has had, has been such a part of my um, career in, in its later years. I was wanted to ask you about your mom because she seems like such a powerful woman from the things that I've read. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder, you know, what has been her impact on you and kind of what role has she played in the, your life in your formative years and how has her spirit and energy motivated you in the present? You know, my mom is somebody who, um, she's very, as you said, she's a very strong woman and she's, she's like very, she's like quietly inspiring to me. She's not somebody who's, she's not like the loudest person in the room, um, but she's very smart. And she, I think has had a really kind of um, subconscious effect on, on all of the decisions in my life, um, which I'm really grateful for. She's very grounded. She teaches me always to be very grounded and to treat people as, you know, I would wish to be treated. My dad, he's more of the like, extrovert he's like when I was younger I used to wear like crazy clothes that I really really regret my dad was like the person who was encouraging that he was like <laughs> he was like you look great you look so weird like the weirder you can be the better you should go out wearing different shoes and face paint and so that's why my career in like the fashion game was a little slow because I was like doing fucking dumb crazy shit when I was younger um but yeah so he on the other hand, is more of the kind of, yeah, he's he's the la the loudest person in the room. So I kind of have a balance of, of both of that, and and I'm really grateful that they both um, were, you know, really encouraging of, of my music because they could have easily not been. Yeah. So I, one of the things going back to what you said earlier about kind of wanting a, a crew, I, I definitely think when I've watched some of your videos and I see the way that you collaborate, you're, you're kind of creating that imagery and, and that vibe in the music and stuff that you make. And I also know that there are some people in your life, some women who are your friends who've been with you from day one. Can you talk about the friendships and relationships that you have with women and who are homies from back in the day and how important that is for you today? Yes. Um, I'm so like, I'm like waiting for this video to play, but it's not gonna play now. My best friend, Twiggy, who is also my manager, she recorded a video for, I guess, like the video part of this thing that's happening today, and I'm dying to see it. Oh, we, I don't we, think we, it's gonna happen. It. Oh, you got, got it! We got, we got, we got the <laughs> clip, so. Oh my God, oh, are you gonna play it? Oh my God, sorry, freaking out. Um, so, yeah, we got um, the tape. We... <laughs> so Twiggy, who is here somewhere, I don't really know where she is, I can't see, but um, yeah, she, she is um, somebody who, I, the thing is about me is like, with the whole crew thing, like when it started happening, I really like took it to an extreme because I like work with the same people 
on repeat and I work with my friends all the time and it's it brings me so much joy and um Luckily for me, a lot of those people are women. One of those people is Twiggy, who I've mentioned. We've known each other since we were 11. And um, now she is part of my management team alongside um, Sam, who is a straight white male, unfortunately. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, I'm kidding. He's great. He's great. We love him. We, we give him a free pass. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm really lucky to have actually both of them are people who I've known since I've, I was 11. And um, yeah, I mean, we all work together every day, we live in the same house. It's very, it's a lot, uh, but it's great. Um, and yeah, she, both of them are people who are so solid and loyal. And I, and I love that in all of my collaborators and particularly the women who I um, have worked with repeatedly. I just feel, I mean, all the people, men, women, however you identify, um, it's just, I enjoy collaborating with the people I collaborate with because there is a real acceptance of, um, you know, to be whoever you are. Um, and there's a freedom um, with the way we all make each other feel, whether that's, um, you know, doing a job like management, which is, you know, more kind of serious, or whether it's being creative and being in the studio with someone like AG, there, there is, there's just a freedom and a sense of kind of, no rules and no boundaries, and that's what I love about all my collaborators. That's what's up. So let's check out this video with Twiggy. <laughs> I'm Twiggy. Um, I work on Charlie's management team. Uh, I also live with her and have known her for 17 years. Um, and we are here in the office. Charlie and I met on my first day of uh, secondary school, and I just sort of called this friend of ours a bit of a mean name, as 11-year-olds do. And in retaliation, she like pushed me in a bush. And then I came out and I had twigs in my hair and Charlie goes, Twiggy! And from then on, it kind of just stuck. I think when we were about 14 or 15, um, you know, she started her MySpace page. And I think that in her own head, she could see things happening. And I think that when we were like, 18, 19 in that year, things kind of really blew up with um, I Love It um, and then Fancy and then like all those songs. She probably always knew that it could be a reality. She's a kind of A&R exec, label head, manager, <laughs> and does her own stuff as well. She's definitely led the charge on like how she wants the music to sound, who she wants to make it with, who's producing, who's featuring, like all of those pieces of the product is, is certainly nowadays and for the last few releases put together by her. And everything that she signs up to, she puts herself 100% into. Unwrapped vinyl. I actually, me and Charlie helped I think I helped put this together, the best album you will ever buy. So, you know, we like to keep it humble. The album was always going to be called Just Charlie, and it was going to always be like, you know, quite a sort of emotional or vulnerable piece of work. And I guess she just wanted to be naked on it. It did cause the label quite a heart attack when we delivered this um, about 24 hours before release. <laughs> a side of Charlie that I don't think people get to see. Um, this is quite a soppy answer, but her kindness, you know, if you're being plastered on artwork and interview, like, it's hard to portray that because it's such a, you know, you're, it's such a product and a brand and, and kindness, I don't think, necessarily always comes across. I think, you know, those who do know her and who've worked with her, um, know how kind she is, but I think, yeah, that'd be something that I would want people to know. Oh. <laughs> Are you dying? She's dying. Oh, my God. So good. Loved it. So, yeah, what do you, what do you, tell me more. What, like, give me some, give me some reactions from that video. Well, obviously, like, we see each other every day. We don't, like, sit around and talk 
like that to each other. Like, Twiggy's never like, you're so kind. <laughs> <laughs> like, and if she did, I'd be like, fucking loser. <laughs> so it's just, you know, it's, we, it, I think sometimes um, we probably take our situation for granted because we're so lucky that we get to work you know, with our best friends every day. I, like, literally, like, wake up and we're, like, in a house together, like, having so much fun. Um, and, yeah, I think we don't always, you know, like, take the time to really, like, have a reality check on that and realise how lucky we are. And, by the way, love you guys. Love you too. Very kind. Two kind like people. I didn't even put my shoes on for that interview. Loved it. She, yeah. Like, course, Such a pro. I love it. I love it. Um, so, yeah, it's very, very sweet, very sweet. Yeah, so, you know, we've been talking about your early years, and uh, we actually have, we took used the Wayback Machine to pull up one of your old MySpace pages from <laughs> 2009. No, this is so scary. Oh. <laughs> oh, my God! What am I doing? The Death Star. Oh. <laughs> Tell me what's happening here. Okay, you know what's actually crazy though, yeah, is this photo is actually, this was the first like professional photo shoot I ever did with a photographer called Rankin, who is like kind of a big deal. He's like kind of a big deal. He's a British photographer, uh, like quite a like famous like 90s fashion photographer. Like, um, yeah, it, it was kind of a big shoot and it was for his book called Destroy, which is where he took photos of artists and then they made collages around them and then they were printed in, in his book. And because he's, like, quite a big deal photographer, he was, like, you know, obviously, like, hair, makeup and styling will totally come down to us. Like, don't worry, like, we've got you covered. And I was like, no, I've got it. I'm going to do my <laughs> own styling and my own hair and makeup. And I guess this is what happened when that happened, so... And this is a classic John Aitchison, my dad, being like, this is amazing, like, this is, like, keep going, this is the way, you know? So, yeah, uh, it's a nightmare, but, yeah. <laughs> I know you've talked a lot about, you know, being in the rave scene and experiencing that as, as a young person, and one of the things I read that you said was it was one of the first times you sort of got into the LGBT community and really saw that. Can you tell me a little bit about that particular experience, what it was like, you know, meeting different people and, and sort of getting engaged in this community and learning about it and embracing it? Yeah. Um, I guess really before I started going to raves and going to London, um, I hadn't really had that much direct contact with the LGBTQ community just because um, you know, I wasn't really going to school with anybody who was a member of that community, or at least at that point, an out member of that community. Um, and that was really my, like, life was, like, going to school, you know? And when I went to London, and especially when I started playing um, at these raves, it was like... I felt like I was in, like, a movie. Like, it was so inspiring and fantastic to be around so many different diverse people and cultures and communities and a predominant one being the LGBTQ plus community um, who were extremely welcoming and embracing of me and my music and my weird fashion wig thing that I was doing. Um, and, yeah, I mean, it just felt like, kind of, to me, it felt like a, a sort of a, a second home, I suppose, because I felt like I could be as outlandish and freakish and freaky as I wanted, but the word freak wasn't ever being used in, like, a negative way. It was always in a really positive and encouraging and fun way. Like, to be a freak was to be this kind of, like, butterfly. Like, I don't know if that sounds cheesy, but it was just so encouraged and fun and wonderful. And I would look around when I would go to these 
these braids and I would just see all of this like incredible fashion that I'd never seen before. Like people making their own clothes and um, doing like crazy makeup and crazy hair and people playing music that I'd never heard before. And um, often that was really coming from people who are a part of the LGBTQ plus community. So yeah, it really kind of, I've always f just felt very comfortable um, in the presence of, of that community. You know, I first kind of got familiar with some of your music when you, when you dropped the uh, True Romance record, you know, Nuclear Seasons track and the you ha ha ha, like that was in my, in my world, you know? And um, cool. also there was at that time, you know, later, a little bit later on you had Fancy and you had the I Love It tracks. What was your ultimate goal? What were, what were you? What were you? What were you trying for? Because obviously, true, true romance is like this uh, critical, you know, phenomenon. Everybody loves it, and obviously, I love it. And fans are like these pop phenomenons. Mm -hmm. What were? What, what was your goal? What were you trying to do at that time in your career? When I entered the music industry, I was like, I want to be Britney, like th because I didn't, I didn't really know, and I, there was like no other route for me. It was like this is what happens when you sign a record deal? Like, you become Britney, like, obviously. <laughs> I was like, that's the only path, you know? And then I signed my record deal and I was like, oh, I'm not Britney yet, you know? Which is fine, um, it's okay. But, um, like, I kind of, you know, before being in the music industry, I didn't realise that there there were so many different paths, you know? And, and I, um, I, I signed when I just turned 16 and then I kind of went to LA to write with uh, actually like a lot of people who had worked on Britney records and that was really cool but I didn't click with any of those people and I tried for for a really long time I mean I wrote some cool songs but it didn't feel like they really understood me and I didn't really feel that inspired by them and it you know it, it wasn't like a painful experience or anything it just it wasn't it was kind of boring at the time I learned a lot but I wasn't I wasn't like vibing, let's say. <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> but then I met this guy, Ariel Rexshide, who um, was a big part of True Romance. And when we met, we clicked. And he wasn't making music that sounded like Britney. He was, I don't even know, he was making music that was extremely like 80s inspired. And I was at that point like listening to some of the things that he was referencing, I was listening to like to Pow and Martika and like The Cure and Kate Bush. And so I was like, okay, cool. Like we are vibing, like great. Like we get it, we're on the same level. And then it just flowed. It, there was no intention. Once I discovered like there were more paths than just like be Britney, there were like millions of different paths. That's when I, I didn't really at that point have a plan. I just wanted to make what I, felt and I think that's why um, actually some quite different sounding records came out of that at that time so obviously like the true romance stuff was something that Ariel and I were really working together on and he did actually have like a lot of input on that it definitely didn't feel like me like being more kind of singular which is definitely what it is now even though of course my collaborators are, are you know very involved in what I do um, I did feel, I, I felt like I was being led by Ariel and I'm really happy that I was. I don't say that in a negative way at all. Um, but then at the same time, when I wasn't working with Ariel, I was like making, I love it and fancy and not sitting there going like, these are big songs. I actually really thought I love it was like the worst song ever. I was like, no one gets this. Like this is like, I honestly didn't even know what it was about when I wrote it. I wrote it in like 20 minutes in my hotel room with my boyfriend sitting there. He was like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, I'm writing this song. Like, I don't really get it, but whatever. And he was like, yeah, it sounds bad. And I was like, I know. <laughs> and then, so then I was like, okay, I'm gonna stop making this. And then I spent like hours making this other song. And I was like, this is the song. And then I went and saw um, the producer of I Love It, Patrick Berger the next day and I was like, look at this amazing song. I spent like five hours working on it and he was like, cool, do you do anything else? And I was like, yeah, I did this 
thing. It's really weird. It's called I Love It. I don't know what it's about. And he was like, that's the one, you know? Yeah. Um, so I didn't really have... Sorry, I'm talking so much. I know that's you have so hear. many questions. Okay. We're here to hear you Just talk. tell me, like, <laughs> just be like, shh. No, no, no. It's um, good. I'm, I'm, I'm loving all of this. Okay, you love it? Cool. <laughs> um, so then... <laughs> ah, so then... Yeah, I didn't have a... I didn't, at that point, I was just, like, making what I felt. That's the short answer to your question. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell me how you, because after reading so many interviews that you've done through the years, mm -hmm. I feel like I've read different takes from you on the album Sucker. Tell me how you felt about it when you were doing it and then also how you feel about it now. Okay, I felt great about it when I was doing it because generally, there's only one song. <laughs> 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 you know, there's only one song in my life that I didn't feel good about when I was making it. All other songs, love, feel great about them. So when I was making Sucker, I felt great. Like, I was in it and I think I went through a phase in life where I was quite anti that album just because the sonic decisions I made quite close after that record were so extremely different. And so it put me in a space where I was like, how can I relate to this previous body of work, which sounds so different and so far away from the headspace that I'm in now. But now that I have uh, kind of sat with it and like had my little like bitch about it, I feel like, I feel good about Sucker as an album because doing it slaps. <laughs> Need Your Love is a fucking anthem. I mean, boom clap, we know. <laughs> she's a local, but, like... <laughs> she's also a fucking iconic, OK? So there are moments of that album which I really do love. I think now just, you know, now that I know what I can do as an executive producer um, and an artist, I know how I could have made that album better, you know? And so I think... But, you know, I feel like that with a lot of, not all works, but some works, you know? Like, I, I, I think, like, oh, I could have, like, got this person to do the drums on this. And, you know, at that point, like, it was really my first kind of time, like, out on my own in, in, in the world, like, really, like, being like, I'm going to curate this album myself. And that's something that you, you get better at over time. And now I don't feel... Now I feel really, really confident, and I feel like I know exactly what I'm doing. But then, obviously, like, the next the next album that happens, I'll be like, oh, my God, like, I should have done this on that. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's <laughs> yeah. like a growing... You learn as you go. And the song is Break the Rules, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. I just... it's I, I wrote it in a writing camp, and I was like... I've said... I, maybe you know this story, I don't know, but I, I wrote it, and I was like... Whoever ends up singing this song is so fucking stupid. <laughs> and then it was me. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. You've collaborated a lot with Nooney. How has that relationship sort of interwoven through all the different stylistic choices that you make? Well, Nooney, um, so for those of you who don't know, Nooney Bao is um, a songwriter. She's amazing and also has been a friend of mine for. I don't know, seven, six, seven years, something like that. Why I love collaborating with Nuni um, and why I think she's such a good songwriter is because she supports the artist. Like, I feel like there are a lot of songwriters out there who, even though they are extremely talented, they are sometimes very keen on pus pushing their own agenda, which is fine. Um, if maybe you're writing a song for an artist and they're not in the room, or if you're writing for an artist who is kind of willing to just l let go of, of the creative control and, and maybe wants the songwriter to, to take over, but I'm not that person. And I've definitely been in rooms where I've kind of experimented with new songwriters and they <laughs> don't they don't want me to... Ha they, I'm, I, like, can't get a fucking word in edgeways, and you know how much I talk. Like, that's really hard. <laughs> 
for me. So um, that's it's it's a struggle. And Nooney is somebody who is so supportive of the artist's vision, and you can really see that by the fact that she's co-written songs with me from Room Room to doing it to God, I don't even remember. Like a lot, like you know, a lot of stuff. And um, she's very diverse, and she really lets me breathe and. That's why I love working with her. And she's just so talented as well. So we actually have some footage of Nooney in the, in the studio where you guys typically record. So Fun. check it out. Let's go into the studio where we're working at the moment. This is where it all happens, so to speak. Yeah. It's always, it feels very relaxed to work in here and it's, that's the thing, when we work together, it's just about like having fun. And that's why I love working with her, because you don't have to analyze everything. We are so comfortable with each other now as friends that we can really, like we dare to suck in the studio, you know? We can come up with really shitty ideas, but sometimes that's what makes something good come out of it. I have this book, because I like to keep things analog and I have a bunch of pictures in here and here is the first time I ever met Charlie. This was in London like 2013. Oh yeah, here is me and Charlie in Sweden. This is when we went to the ABBA museum. To me it feels like she's Swedish because she loves Ikea and <laughs> we always talk about Ikea and we're like obsessed with Ikea. And then now she's learning to speak uh, Swedish, which is great. So we can have our secret language that no one would understand here in LA. It would be great. This is uh, when we went to LA. Like the same day as we met the first time, we were like, oh, let's go to LA together and write songs. It was just like a 24 seven, you know, um, party house and studio. I remember when we did the Room Room EP, for example. That was more like us partying and needed when we wanted like a soundtrack for the for the partying, sort of, in a way. Some sessions party vibes and some sessions it's like grandma vibe, I would say. And sometimes we love what we're doing and sometimes we hate what we're doing, but at least we're trying different type of things, you know? You can come up with great, great things. You know, when you feel comfortable with people. This is for you, Charlie. And Schickling Tack. Very cute. So what does that mean? She said, a chicken, please. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't... She said I was learning Swedish. That's a bit of a stretch. I can say, like, five sentences, and one of them is en Schickling Tack, so, yeah. Are you a fan of chicken? Um... I mean, it's not like my like when I when I land in Sweden, I'm like and chicken tag. But you know, I've I've eaten chicken before, yeah. So. <laughs> That's the tea. Um, I wanted to ask you a question that we got on Twitter, specifically in the context of your practice directing music videos and also running a record label. Um, the question comes from Charlie XCXAU on Twitter, and they're saying, you are a very prominent businesswoman, always looking for new opportunities and projects. What is your process of engaging in a new project? How does it start? Um, it starts from a crazy idea, um, and then me telling the crazy idea to my team and them either being like, no, or yes. For example, yesterday, I, I text them. This is so pointless, but I'll share it. Yesterday, I text them and I was like, I think me and Tovlo should open a bar together. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, you don't know anything. Like, why would you even do that? And I text Tovlo and she's like, Yes. <laughs> so watch this space. Um, but yeah, it really just starts from a crazy idea. And then the process is just really committing to it. You know, I don't, I don't like to, I don't like to do things that I can't fully throw myself into. And honestly, there's been a, there's been a few times 
where I've felt like, you know, I'm in something and I'm like, I can't give this my full attention, so I need to step out. But often it doesn't happen because we, as a team, we're kind of, we really like think about like, okay, do I have the time available to, I don't know, manage this artist? Do I have the time available to shoot this music video for this other person? Like, you know, it's, we, we kind of think of it like that. What is it like when you put on these other hats? Like right now, you know, you just produced a hit TV show on Netflix. Like, what is it? it switching I don't know over? if it was a hit, but... Well, but <laughs> it was dope. I it watched was, it. It was good. It was good. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what's it like going from the studio, you know, doing that thing and, 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 and operating that world to going to, a, you know, the boardroom or wherever it may be to, 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 to do this, this other kind of enterprise? It's so fun um, because, uh, as I was saying, like, to, to me, for me, like, being creative in all spheres of what I do is 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 so fun and um, you know speaking about of Nasty Cherry, they they're a band that like we use the TV show as a platform to kind of kickstart their career and we myself Sam and Twiggy now manage them alongside two other artists um, that we're currently working with. And that feels so exciting to me um, because I, you know, can still use all the things that I've learned as an artist um, and a performer and a creative director of my own work to kind of help them. So it doesn't necessarily feel like taking off a hat completely. It's more like tipping the hat, you know, it's like still kind of on. Um, like, good day, sir, you know, <laughs> like that. Um, but um, yeah, I I love everything. And I think, I think I'm not, I'm definitely not at the point where I'm like, I'm not gonna be an artist anymore. Like definitely not there yet. Um, but I think, that, you know, possibly there will one day be a point where I'm like, I don't wanna be like on tour all the time or like, making like two albums a year or two mixtapes a year or whatever. Like, I just want to like write songs and and like manage this really incredible person. Not yet. I'm talking like 10, 15 years. Like we're good. We still, <laughs> we still got a long run left. It's fine. But, um, the, and, and at that point it doesn't scare me because I still feel very creatively inspired to do all of those other things. Do you feel like you're at a point or is there a point where an artist has the optimal amount of control over their image, over their music, over what they put out into the world? Is there a, a point like, do that you, you get to? Yeah, think? like do you feel like you've gotten there or do you feel yeah. like there, yeah. I feel, I feel very in control. Um, and I feel that way because I have a great team and I have as much as a lot of my fans would hate to believe a good relationship with my record label. Um, <laughs> and um, I also, I think control really can sometimes, for me at least, come, come from myself. Um, and for me, I, I let go of wanting to control um, how I was perceived. And when I let go of that, it kind of, everything kind of began to make sense. Um, so I guess it's about having control, but also letting go of the control. That's what's been really helpful for me. Um, I was at one point in my career, I was so, I was so controlled by this idea of having commercial success, you know? It was something that like, you know, made me feel really anxious and made me feel less than and made me release songs like Break the Rules. And <laughs> like, you know, like a joke, but really like that's why that song happened. And I felt, yeah, I just felt very like, it was all about, at one point in my career, it was all about like wanting that. And I have had that and 
it was such a crazy and amazing experience to have like global songs and to be able to like, you know, whatever, do the shit I was doing. But I can also still do that now. Um, but I'm singing music that I will stand by for like the rest of my life. And the people who listen to it will stand by it for the rest of their lives rather than having a kind of moment, you know? And I think for me that like, the con losing the, con the this idea that was controlling my mind of like, I must be commercial, like it freed me and it actually gave me back so much of my own power that I had kind of lost because I was able to f really find my own identity um, and, and that gave me ultimate control of everything that I was doing. So you made a documentary about feminism yeah. many years ago. I was wondering uh, sort of what do you think has changed or evolved in the industry today from back when you made that film till right now um, in terms of women in music? I think the main thing that has changed is that women are talking about feminism all the time, which is great. And all artists, I would say, are aware of the narrative and the industry as a whole. I don't think a huge amount has changed and that's because the industry at its core, there needs to be like a change from the core of the industry and the core of society, because this isn't just in music, this is everywhere. Like there is not equality in pay there is not equality in the way women are treated in the workplace still in some cases. And like, it's just, it's this kind of internalized culture, unfortunately, that really needs to change from within and steps are being taken, but it's like, it's constant, it's hard, it's difficult, it's difficult conversations, it's, the Me Too movement, it's the Time's Up movement, it's like people being extremely brave and extremely strong and people making legislative changes and um, changes to the infrastructure of their industries, like that is how it will change. And that's a lot of hard work for a lot of people behind the scenes and in front of their cameras to do and it's constant. and. And so I, whilst I hope I don't sound too pessimistic, I, I just, you know, I, I know that myself and many other of my fellow artists are doing their best, but it's like, whilst I do think that there has been progression, I, I think it's, it's pretty constant. Like it, it's constantly gotta be focused on. You know, I mean, I don't know, it's incredible for me to talk to you and know all the different hats that you wear, all the different the different ways you're tipping your hat. <laughs> yeah. You know, because it's, it, it's, it's amazing. And I wonder, in the midst of all that, how are you able to take care of yourself and, and look after yourself without getting sort of burnt out? That's kind of the hardest thing for me, and it's something that I'm really, like, working on, but I'm a little behind with that. I started therapy, like, thanks, guys. I, I did too, I, I started February. When did you it, start? Therapy in February, yeah. I started like two weeks ago. Oh, that's what's up. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, not a seasoned pro yet, but like, it's amazing. And I mean, I think in the UK, um, like, the, I mean, I, I don't know totally what, it, what it's kind of like here, but the impression that I get is that therapy seems to be more of a kind of common and like uh, accepted thing. Whereas in the UK, it's, it's quite rare, wouldn't you say? It's quite like, people are like, oh, therapy, like, did you go to LA and now you've got a therapist? Like, there's this, <laughs> there's this real, like, association with, like, therapy being this, like, privileged, pointless thing. Um, and here, I feel like 
it's so much more, uh, whilst obviously like all discussions around mental health need to be kind of more accepted and, you know, m more open. I, I, it feels to me like here, yeah, therapy is kind of like accepted. You know, just the fact that you guys were like, whoa, like in the UK people would be like, like, no one would be like, woo, people would just be like, oh, like, weird. Um, so, yeah, thanks. I feel supported. And um, it's, so I'm doing that. That's great. And I also love going to the Korean spa. So <laughs> that's my other, yeah, woo, love that too. That's it. Go me. That's like my two, yeah, it's my, that's my shit, yeah. That's, what do you get done at the Korean spa? What are, what are like oh, the go-to treatments? Okay, so <laughs> sometimes I just dip. Like, have you ever been to a Korean spa? I, my, my girl took me uh, last year for the first time. I haven't been back. It, which one? Spa Castle in New York? No, not Spa Castle. Okay. I, can't, I can't think of the name, but yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but Spa Castle's dope. It's fucking amazing. <laughs> it's so good. Okay, so sometimes I won't even get a treatment. Sometimes I'm just like hot pool, cold pool, mm -hmm. hot pool until you like want to pass out. Love that. <laughs> and like steam room, like I love it. It's so good. And then other times, you know, the scrub, like whatever. I love it. I live, I live for it. Yeah. Anyways. That's cool. So See you there. Cool. <laughs> Do you have any other things that you want to tell? you know, young people who are trying to create, who are trying to express themselves, who are trying to become themselves? Yeah, um, I mean, it's a journey. That's the first thing I would say. And um, I think it's important to know, like, I feel like we're all, <laughs> we're all like, you know, on this journey of like finding ourselves. Like, who are we? Like gotta love myself, like, gotta be, you know, gotta be, like, I don't care about being perfect, like, I'm, you know, like, there's all this fucking shit, like, yes, you do have to work towards that, but I think it's good for young people to know that, like, if that journey isn't easy for you, it's okay, you know, if, if you find it hard to get yourself in a place where you, look in the mirror and like are totally happy with everything that you are like don't beat yourself up about that because a lot of people find it really difficult myself included to get to a space where I feel like 100% okay and I think some people make it look really easy um and that's because Instagram is a lie but um, <laughs> you know it's like it's okay I think what I would my main message would be that it's okay to to feel vulnerable, it's okay to make mistakes, and it's okay to, yeah, be, have ups and downs in your life because it can't always be smooth sailing. If it is, that's so great for you, and I'm, I'm, you're extremely lucky, but for most of us, I don't think it is like that, and you can't beat yourself up too much if that's the case because you're only human, you know? Okay, everybody, let's make some noise for Charlie XCX. Yeah, Can you catch? Oh! <laughs> Sorry. Can you catch?